everyone. So switching gears um, rather radically. I'm so happy to be here with Jeffrey Gunlock, um, who started his career as a nearly broke rock and roll drummer um, and now goes under the nickname either the billionaire Bond guru or the Bond king. And his not even a decade old firm, Double Line Capital, manages a total of 112 billion? 116. 116 billion and counting. Um, and um, what he says and does literally moves markets. But Jeffrey has also predicted a couple of events that have really rocked our world from the 2008 global financial crisis um, to the election of Donald Trump. So I hope we can learn from him how he does it all. And let's, let's actually start there. What actually helps you see these tidal waves that other people don't see coming? Um, I think what's important is you have to really be objective and not get stuck in thinking about the outcome that you're hoping for and acknowledging that no matter what you're doing, there's a potential that it's going to go wrong. I see a lot of people fail because they have themselves in a certain framework and instead of saying, make sure I'm risk managing that if something goes wrong here, they basically cover their ears and hum. And they say, uh, I don't want Donald Trump to be president. So and you saw all the, the many clips of famous celebrities saying there's not a snowball's ch chance in hell it'll win. And yet, I was, I'm very apolitical. I don't really like any of them. So it's kind of like I, I just try to figure out what's happening. I didn't exactly want Trump to win, but it was just obvious to me even before the primary started that he was going to. And, and I, why was it obvious? Well, I thought for sure that Hillary Clinton could never win. So I figured that whoever ran against her would win. And uh, the establishment, the old establishment, uh, was pretty f a gung ho behind Jeb Bush. And I met Jeb Bush one on one for about an hour, and he just did not have the fire in his belly. And I started to realize that with the establishment having all their hopes pinned on Jeb or some other hand selected establishment person, the most outside of that realm was going to win. And that was Donald Trump. And hence your prediction. So there's a couple of pieces of artwork that helps you think or that clarifies the way your, your, your mind works. And let's start with the Mondrian. And I'd love to have you explain what it is about this piece that inspires your thought process. Well, Mondrian, like so many other artists of the early 20th century, had their world rocked by the Armory Show of 1913, where they were uh, introduced to Picasso and Brock's Cubism. Before Mondrian went into this uh, language, he was painting flowers and he was making money painting flowers. But he saw Picasso's cubism and it changed his world. And he decided that he loved the cubism in terms of trying to find something essential, but the cubism didn't go far enough. So he took on the mantle and he kept reducing his pictorial language, trying to get to what was essential. And the language really is fundamentally tied to the X and Y axis, which represent tension but a hierarchical equivalence of objects and of, of structure. And he kept doing more and more reductivism until he got to this in 1931, which was a commission for a town hall in the Utrecht district of the Netherlands. And this is what he came up with, which was ultimately the end point of cubism. And as a thank you for doing this for the town hall, they hated it and they, they took it down and they sold it to uh, Amsterdam, where it is now. But what I love about it is when I, th my thought process, when I think about investing, it's really about what is essential. Take the complex world with so many variables and so many uh, interlocking pieces, what's really essential in it? And that's kind of what this says to me visually. Okay, I want to do one more piece before we move on. Um, Escher. Escher. What does this tell you? Escher's a real optical illusionist. Uh, this is based on a staircase, I think, by this guy named Penrose. But in investing, there's a tremendous affinity that people have for herding behavior, where they all follow the crowd. And uh, particularly as institutional fiduciaries, there's a loathing to be wrong alone. <laughs> if there's a consensus opinion and it ends up being wrong, it's OK, because you have plenty of company that are wrong with you. But, but this is called ascending, descending, and it's an optical illusion. You can see that they're never getting anywhere. Uh, they're, they're perpetually going up, perpetually going down, and it's because the geometry of it fools your brain. And I, I just think that when people herd in the investment world and do things like lemmings, they're never going to get anywhere. And so Escher speaks to me in that way. 
So you were a philosophy major, and there's a quote from Nietzsche that I've heard you use. Insanity in individuals is sometimes rare, but in groups, it is the rule. That's how, right. do, how do you avoid groupthink? Uh, you have to uh, have the courage to think for yourself and to look for examples of where everyone thinks something is obvious, but as the great technician Joe Granville said, what is obvious is obviously wrong. <laughs> And so you just you try to avoid that. I, another artist we didn't have an image for is this guy named Donald Judd, who was one of the great, he wasn't really a sculptor by his own definition. He made what are called specific objects. And he didn't make them himself, like Andy Warhol. He had other people make them. But he was an art critic and then a painter, and he was very integral in the New York art, art scene. And he was working with other artists. And at a certain point, he said, I can't do this anymore. My vision, my work is actually being diluted and contaminated by too many ideas. So he decamped for Marfa, Texas, which is literally in the middle of nowhere, where he got a clarity of vision. So a lot of people in my shoes, they love to go to powwows with their peers and share ideas and have uh, you know, Titans dinners where you, you know, learn off of each other's ideas. I can't do that. I've been invited to them, I've gone, and I go in there and here's Joe over here and he's bullish on Apple and his case is wonderful, and here's Tim, and he's bearish on Apple, not Tim Cook, but he's bearish on Apple, and, and uh, convincing case, and I just get confused. So what I do is I try to think independently, read news wires, and wait for those moments when the facts are the same, and yet all of a sudden, everybody's interpretation of it is changing. Nietzsche also said there are no facts, just interpretations, which sounds book. like our world today. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's go back to Trump and let's start with the positive. What's the best thing the Trump administration has done for markets? What's gone for right? For markets? Uh, I, I don't think the markets have had much of anything in reaction to Trump. Um, hmm. I, I think the best thing that Trump has done broadly is, I mean, and this probably won't be popular in this room, but he's trying. I mean, he's actually trying to do something. You might completely disagree with it, but he is trying. Uh, and I'll give him some, some credit for that. But for markets, you know, the f thing that was funny is I predicted Donald Trump's victory and I made no money off of it. None. I, I was in the same mindset as so many of the people that said he's not going to win, like a Mark Cuban, for example, who I think a couple days before the election, he said there's no chance he'll win, but if he does, the market will drop 80%. Right. And it dropped about 5% for about an hour. I thought there would be more of a drawdown hmm. on kind of a negative reaction. But talk about how the facts are the same, but opinions change. Two days before the election, it's like if he wins, it's a disaster. Two days after the election, we were being deluged with uh, research notes from major investment banks saying this is the most bullish thing that ever happened. So, and yet it doesn't seem like much has really happened. There's still tremendous hope for tax changes that would be positive to valuations of U.S. stocks right. by increasing profitability, for decreased regulation. I'm from Missouri on all this, considering the lack of progress on the agenda so far. And what explains that um, swing in sentiment other than just pure schizophrenia? Uh, it's really hard to understand. Uh, I think it was just reaction to the, to the fact that markets started going up a lot. And people like to extrapolate what's been happening. So once something starts to be, a market behaves in a certain way, suddenly everyone says, oh, that's going to continue to happen. And I, I just think it was that kind of a, of a reactionary momentum that led to where we are today. So you said this a few months ago about Trump. Many people who voted for him think something is going to change for them. They expect their wages to rise and America to be great again. What's the risk in that? The risk is that the fundamentals underneath the economy make that unlikely to happen. You're, you're not, the guy that, you know, served in Afghanistan and came back and was working fixing uh, air conditioners and is now laid off, uh, he's never really going to get a job again. It, it's sort of, a, you're selling a, a hope that is perpendicular to sort of the demographic and realistic trends that are going on. And so uh, the, the risk is that these people that had a certain anger that was tapped into by candidate Trump, now President Trump, that their anger actually multiplies when their lot in life doesn't improve. 
And so what I've been saying is if you thought the 2016 election was wacky, and I have said this prior to election day, I said, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till we get to 2020, when I'm pretty sure we're not going to have just two, two candidates that are truly in the run. I think we're going to have three, if not four parties, essentially, that are running for president. So it's going to get even weir weirder. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, in, in these presidential elections, what you never see is real discussion about the finances of America, the entitlement programs. I remember when uh, Mitt Romney was against Barack Obama uh, in 08, uh, I, I, or I guess it's no 12, and the debates were quite contentious. Yep. But when they asked the question on Social Security, all of a sudden there was no bone of, of disagreement. It's just, ah, that's fine. We don't have to worry about that. Yes, I agree, it's fine. Next question, please. Because no one wants to talk about that third rail of politics. Right. Come 2020, the problems of the f funding of the entitlement program, Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and what's left of Obamacare, are not going to be possible to be ignored. And so suddenly we're going to have this moment where we realize that we actually have to do something. And I think what you'll be surprised about is how easy this thing is to fix once we acknowledge that there's a problem. Okay, so there's a prediction here. You heard it first here. Um, what's the fix? The fix is that you have to uh, raise the eligibility ages and have some amount of means testing. When FDR put uh, Social Security in place, the eligibility age was 65 and life expectancy I think in the country it was 61, and I'm told in New York City it was even lower than that. Right. Now life expectancy, some people say it's 83, some people say it's 78, but the eligibility age is still 65. We just can't afford to have people being retired for the length of their life past 65, so we, have to, we just have to raise it. It's just not that hard to do, except there's this belief that I paid for it, I deserve it, and you're not going to change it. But the baby boomers will not fight for their rights the way that the so-called great generation is hell-bent on fighting for their rights uh, tooth and nail. The baby boomers are very different from other generations, and they'll actually give up very easily, I believe, on their uh, acceptance of, of higher eligibility ages. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. So moving from the future to the present, what are some of the big, biggest risks you see facing the market now? And I want to show two slides. How many people out here would guess that it, some, an artwork called Devil's Fork actually has something to do with the bond market? Uh, and if we can show it, then you can explain it and tell us what it is uh, and why is, it relates to the bond market. Well, this, is, this relates to investing broadly, but this is called the Devil's Fork. Uh, there's also a techno babble name for it called the Triple Encabulator Tuned Manifold. And it showed up in a science journal uh, back about 50, 60 years ago, and it was fairly obscure, and then it was published on the cover of no less august a publication than Mad Magazine. It was on the cover of Mad Magazine in 1960s, awesome. and everyone thought it came from Mad Magazine, but it, it didn't. And basically, it's an impossible figure. It, it uh, violates the distinction between the background and the element of a figure. If you just cover the bottom, the top makes sense. If you cover the top, the bottom makes sense, but together, it doesn't make any sense. The investment world is full of false ideas. This is like a false idea. It's full of things that people believe that simply are not true. And that's what you have to kind of be, uh, be mindful of. Okay, can we show the slide that shows something that today is, is clearly not true? true or clearly frightening should in, our, be true. in our market that it shouldn't be, be true, true but right. seems to be true. It's a false it, idea, yeah. This is, this is the, the red line on here is the yield that the, the Treasury bond market gives over time since 2008. So it's been fairly stable. It's been a very low level of around 2 to 3 percent for the past eight years or so. The green line is the yield on what's called junk bonds, very bad credit corporate bonds in Europe. And that this is just the average if you invest in a certain slice of those junky bonds out of Europe. And it's shocking that investors are willing to accept the same no default return on junky European credits. Then they, then they don't have any premium on that garbage investment versus U.S. Treasury bonds. And it's all because of manipulated behavior. This is what the, the false idea that's out there now is the policies that are in place to manage our economies in the United States versus Europe are completely contradictory, yet the fundamentals are almost exactly the same. The inflation rate, let's just call it Germany, because it's the biggest, biggest economy in Europe. The German inflation rate is the same as the US inflation rate. The German gross domestic product is the same as the US gross domestic product. Loan growth, retail sales, and capacity utilization in Europe are all stronger 
than they are in the United States. So one could argue that the economic realities of Europe are now somewhat better than those of the United States, and yet they have negative interest rates uh, for their policy. While we've been hiking interest rates four times, going on five in the United States, we did something called quantitative easing, which just means the central bank finances our deficit, which was incredibly illegal when the, we founded the Fed in 1913, but that's a whole other story. But they, we ended up financing our budget deficits by the Federal Reserve basically just buying the bonds. Whenever we have a circular financing scheme, we stopped that. In Europe, they started it and never stopped. So the fiscal financial realities in Europe are completely artificial. Their interest rates should be much higher than they are today. They're much lower than our interest rates. They should probably be the same or higher. Once Mr. Draghi, who is the head of the ECB, realizes that this can't go on, the order of the financial systems are going to be turned upside down. And it won't be a good thing because it will mean that the liquidity that's been pumping up markets will be drying up. And it'll probably start happening in 2018. And then what happens? Uh, things go down. Uh, I, I think we've, we've been in an artificially inflated market, stocks and bonds, l largely around the world. The U.S. has been particularly a benef benefited from that. And, but I, I think we're looking at a much tougher environment as we move into 2018. Do you think people fully appreciate how global the U.S. stock market is? And I think you've got a statistic no. about... No, the, the U.S. stock market is indeed very global. I mean, 40% of the earnings from the S&P 500 come from overseas. So wow. it's a very, very global market. But what's strange is that the size of the U.S. market compared to the global market is completely out of whack with how big the U.S. economy is as a fraction of the global economy. The U.S. stock market is more than 50% of the capitalization of the global stock market, yet our economy is only 23% of the global economy. So where does that mean we are in a decade? Does that even It, it means that, that investors, I've been talking about this all year, it's, it's been working largely so far, but I think there's a long way to go. I, I think foreign markets will be much better places to be because of uh, the U.S. market being too large for the size of our economy. And our economy is not growing as a percentage of the global economy, far from it. It's actually shrinking as the Chinese economy will surpass the U.S. economy in, in a decade. The Indian economy will probably grow tenfold. Emerging market economies broadly will grow a lot. And so the, the, the demographics of the developed world, the United States thankfully is better than most, but the demographics of the developed world are very, very poor. And this is one of the reasons why we have this problem with you know, discontent at the old uh, middle class, from the old middle class, is that the economy isn't there to, to offer them jobs and the prospects for the future. It's a scary, it's a scary idea. Well, my job is to find, find scary things and to find risk. <laughs> the, my <laughs> critics say, you know, Gunlock, you find, you find seven risks for every one that exists. And I say, guilty, <laughs> that's my job. My job is to try to find out what can go wrong, not cover my ears and hum, and... Better be, to find the risk than to not find it, right? Better to keep your eyes open, yeah. So I want to go to another slide, back to this notion of quantitative easing and what the central banks have been doing for the economy. And this one is the relationship of central banks' balance sheets to the S&P 500. And tell us why this one is frightening. Okay, uh, we've got this on a little backwards. I'll have to, uh, to, to make a word, word picture. The, the dates it, it should be going left to right. They're going right to left, so I've got to think about this backwards. You'll notice that the, that the central bank's balance sheets, that's the stacked line were pretty constant until 2011. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they start going up a lot. If we were to juxtapose the S&P 500 on this is the size of central bank's balance sheets, it's almost a constant. You can make the argument that the strength in financial markets for the past certainly six years has been based upon this balance sheet growth. However, the baseline uh, prediction, and it's a pretty strong prediction, there's a lot of facts underneath it, is that the central bank balance sheets will stop growing at the, at the beginning of 2018 and start falling, which is what I mean by the liquidity that's helped drive the markets and can be an explanatory factor for why they've done so well is going to at least marginally reverse. And if Mr. Draghi, as I said, wakes up and says, we can't keep this house of mirrors going on anymore, then it'll, it'll decline these holdings even more. So that would be a scenario that is not favorable 
for the risk markets that have done so very, very well this year and for the past six years. Does it matter who the next chairman of the Federal Reserve is? Yes, yes, it does. It matters a lot. Um, Janet Yellen has followed on pretty faithfully in the footsteps of Ben Bernanke. Yes. I think that there is no chance that she wants to be Fed chairwoman uh, for another term, right. uh, nor do, do I think the president would want her to be. If I were Janet Yellen, I would be counting the days left in my sentence like a prisoner in jail, <laughs> counting with the things on the wall, hoping that nothing goes wrong because she's so close. It's February of 18 right. that she's out and nothing has gone wrong. Her legacy is really about as good as it can possibly get. She got rid of the zero interest rates. She raised them four, maybe five times by the time she's out. She is starting to roll off the bond buying, the quantitative easing, and nothing bad has happened, at least so far. She's so not Alan Greenspan she, just if she, yet. <laughs> if she can just make it, you know, a few, a few more months, uh, she'll, be, she'll be fine. Yeah, Alan Greenspan was funny. He, he used to say, if you think you understand what I said, you weren't, weren't listening carefully enough. Uh, because he would try to say nothing by sounding like he was saying something. But one, what, one of the things that people see, were saying a few months ago is that Gary Cohn, the uh, number two guy from Goldman Sachs a year ago, was going to be the next Fed chairman. No way, and now that's clearly off the table. Why did you say no way? Too close time? to the bone. I mean, it's one thing to have ex-Goldman people from 20 years ago, middle management, then suddenly ascend to the head of the central bank. But for the number two guy from Goldman Sachs, who was number, it's just too, too, it's just too clubby. I just too much, don't think too much government Sachs. And so now they, say, now they say it's this guy, Warsh, yes. who's, who's going to do it. I actually have a very non-consensus point of view, once again. Um, I think it's going to be Neil Kashkari, who is uh, kind of a, a, not a traditionally trained PhD economist, but he happens to be the most easy money guy that's in the Federal Reserve System today, Neil Kashgari. And that's why I think he might win. He actually wrote an essay yesterday was published that was basically talking about why we should have more easy money policies. And I think uh, the president, if he's going to have any chance of retaining his base, he needs to deliver something to the disaffected middle class. A stronger dollar is not good for ach achieving th that agenda. A weak dollar is actually positive, and easy money is more a friend of, of a weak dollar than, than tight money. And so I think Neil Kashgari, I'm the only, I think I'm the only guy on God's green earth that believes Neil Kashgari. Has he been I, very what, outspoken about the too big to fail banks? Would that be bad news for the banking sector, were, he, were you to be right? Yeah, uh, it, it could be, but easy money, um, Easy money would be good for the banking sector. Uh, it, would, it, would, it would make the, uh, the proposition of the banks who you know, lend long and borrow short, it would be more attractive for them. And can it work for a little while? Can we stave off the day of reckoning? You know, the thing about finance and investments is things take so much longer to unfold than the doom and gloomers say they will. You might remember, you're probably too young, but I remember 1992, there was this guy named Ross Perot, who, <laughs> well, Ross Perot. who bought infomercials to rail against the impending collapse of the United States due to our excessive debt. That was in 1992. Right. There was a book written, uh, I think by Pete Peterson, or at least he was involved, that was called Bankruptcy 1995. It was on the same theme, that because of our indebtedness, we would be in a depression, a deflationary depression by 1995. Well, they're probably right, but they're 25 years at a minimum early. And an investment business early is a synonym for wrong. So don't tell me what to buy, tell me when to buy it. And uh, yes, we can, the day, the day of reckoning is probably five or six years away at a, I think, and it has to do with these things I talked about with the entitlements earlier. So how do you take into account that factor when you see something so clearly, one of these danger signs, one of these frightening things that can't continue to last, yet isn't that that the insanity can go on a lot longer than you ever thought possible? How do you, how do you factor Markets in the Markets can stay insane, irrational much longer, much longer than you can, than stay, you can solvent, stay solvent. Right? Yeah, that, that's true. What you should do is, the reason that so many people don't want to be in my shoes is because it's really overwhelmingly time intensive and intellectually intensive because you have to follow. One, of, what, one guy that I ended up hiring because he said this to me because I really thought he understood the way things worked. He said, I'm tired of managing money. You have to watch every tick all the time. And that's true. And it's, it's, you really have to be committed to it. 
What I'm getting at is you have to watch, 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 and wait for that cusp of change to actually start manifesting itself. So it's, it's a business where you can't take a lot of, a lot of uh, mental time off. So you have to watch and wait for that. Um, right now, things look reasonably good, uh, although we'll not, we won't stop watching. But I mean, for this year, it's, we're getting near the end of the year, but we don't, haven't seen any problems for this year. So we've got a question from the audience. Why would anyone invest in bonds? It's a good question. I, I, uh, I did a, a, a talk in 1997 that was entitled, Why Own Any Bonds at All? And the reason was that that was the question I was getting at just about every meeting I went to. People were saying, our investment committee has realized that bonds are for losers. When, when bonds go down, they go down, uh, you know, stocks can still go up. When, when things go up, stocks go up more. Uh, and it, it's a pretty good question. Uh, I, I think you, you do it to diversify, and I know that's a hackneyed answer, but it really is true. I, I'm, not a fa I'm, uh, I'm not a big fan of bonds now, and I haven't been really for the past four years even though I, I manage them and, and uh, institutions have to own them for various reasons. But the returns have not been very good. I mean, uh, bond returns for the past, basically, time windows for the past six or eight years have been 2.5% from traditional approaches. If you get risky approaches, which obviously have uh, things that you need to consider, you've been able to do more like 8.5, which is fine. But uh, I'm not a big advocate of bonds. I, I think that investors should be light on bonds. And I, so I, I kind of agree with where you're coming from. I'm, <laughs> I'm stuck with it. But, but my, what my role is, I, I, I know many asset pools have to own them. And my job is to get them to the other side of the valley. And interest rates have bottomed. They've already started to rise. You know, it's like I like to quote this from Hemingway, because people say, when are rates going to rise? And I say, well, if you're paying attention, Interest rates started rising, actually, uh, six years ago. And they haven't risen very much, but it's like in The Sun Also Rises, the classic from 1926. Hemingway has uh, the dialogue, uh, how did you go bankrupt, Bill asked. Two ways, Mike said. First gradually, then all at once. <laughs> That's how interest rates bottom. First gradually, and then all at once. We've been in the gradually phase for years. When the, when the all at once comes, I've, I'll feel that I'm doing a service by getting people through it. And that's why I'm still at the game. I mean, I want to see how the movie ends. So from Nietzsche to Hemingway, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>